Hey there, everyone. It's me, Amy. I am so excited to be here today. I have a special guest. Her name is Katie Haynes, and she is a health coach who works with busy moms to help make healthy feel easy. You can probably tell why I had her on because, hello, who wants to hear about healthy feeling easy more than folks who listen to the Feel Good Family Food podcast? And I'm so excited to dive in today because Katie and I are going to be talking about what are some good habits and strategies for healthy moms. So, so often on the podcast, we end up talking about cooking for your family, feeding your kids well, thinking about how you feed your children. But listen, you are equally as important to take care of as your children are. And we're going to dig into that with Katie today, some exciting things around food as self-care and the myth of perfect eating. And so without further ado, I'm going to introduce Katie and have her tell us a little bit about herself. So thanks for being here, Katie. Thank you so much for having me, Amy. I just wanted to say that I love your podcast. I honestly listen to it every week. And when I'm listening, I'm like, yes, girl, yes. <laughs> I get a lot of good wisdom from it. Um, so thank you for putting that out there each week. It really is helpful. Thank um, you so much. For those of you not watching, I'm smiling so big. <laughs> I just feel so honored that someone would give me some of their time to listen. And thank you, Katie, and those of you who are listening for just like giving me a little piece of your time to listen in. So that makes me so yeah. So yeah, who, who are you? Where do you live? I know your mom yourself. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so I'm a health coach, as you said. Um, I've been in practice for about seven years. I live in Maryland with my four-year-old, soon-to-be five-year-old son, and my husband, dog, two cats, the whole crew. <laughs> and um, yeah, I just stay busy cooking and writing recipes, helping families eat healthier and helping them make it feel easy because that's what it's all about. That's how we stick with it, right? Yes. That's so funny. I have this piece of paper that I keep on my desk because I, it's my mantra to myself when I'm creating things. And this is why you and I get along so well, because I think we have a similar mission and it says mm -hmm. make it easier for more people to eat healthier. And I've added more often as a tag to that. But like, when I think about like, what am I doing here? What's my purpose? Like that is such a huge piece of it. So I love that we get to dive in and meld our brains together and share this with yeah. folks today. So you're a mom, you've been a health coach for longer than you've been a mom, it sounds like. How did you end up on this path? Like what brought you to the world of health coaching and um, brought you to this mission of making healthy living easier for folks? So I've always been into eating healthy, healthy. I uh, grew up as a ballet dancer and as a ballet dancer, we're really focused on being skinny. Not everybody, but you know, my group, my circle was focused on dieting and being skinny. And that's what I thought it was all about. Um, and so from an early age, I started dieting, didn't need to, but that's what I was doing. Um, and in that though, I would read all the diet books and start to learn about food and how it affects your body. And I was just really into it, really interested in how food affects your body. Um, and then several years later, I started looking at like macrobiotic and the energetics of food. And while I, I don't practice that anymore, it was just that beginning step of that food can really affect how you feel. And I know I've seen that kind of play out in my life when I was able to move away from like diet mentality and diet culture and feeling guilt and um, just always worrying about calories and what I was eating and moving into just eating to feel good and let that food give you energy and allow it to be the vehicle to do what you want to do with your life. You like the fun things that you want to do with your life, allow food to kind of be that vehicle. Um, and I saw a lot of people feeling confused about eating healthy. And I just thought, gosh, this is so, this is, this can be really easy and simple. So um, that's also my mission is to teach people just let's make it simple. Let's make it easy because it can be, and it gives you so much when you do that. Yeah. You said something there that I want to dig into, because I think that folks, including me, can identify with this, which is that you went through phases where dieting, counting calories, you know, restricting food groups, maybe I'm speaking for myself as much as I am for you, felt like the answer. And you were mm -hmm. able to move away from that and focus on food that makes you feel good, which you know I'm all about because feel good family food podcast. What 
did that look like for you and or how do you help clients to make that shift? Because I know that there are folks listening. There are folks in my life. I have been this person who thinks that like the next diet is the answer. Right now it's keto. It Mm -hmm. used to be paleo. Um, You know, they're all diets in another name. And I'm all about finding the food that works for your body. And sometimes those look like some of these diets, but I think Mm -hmm. there's a big difference. So can you talk to us about like what that process looks like of moving from one to moving to something that like really works for you uniquely? I think what it comes down to is trusting yourself because when we're doing a diet, we're putting all of our trust into this diet to quote, fix us. Um, to give us the body we want or to give us whatever it is that we're looking for. But if we can kind of shift that and, and realize first that we have to kind of trust ourselves. um, I think that's where we can get into a space where we don't have to rely on a diet to um, come back to center or to lose a little bit of weight or whatever it is, whatever your goal is. Um, Trusting yourself is the first kind of step in doing that. And I think how we get to doing that is by settling into your body and understanding what it, what foods feel like when you're eating. So how your body feels when you eat a certain meal uh, versus another meal. Yeah. Would you agree that there's like this other piece of feeling around like also knowing what hunger feels like? I mean, I think one of the things that I've had to develop over time that I realized that I wasn't getting from diets and plans and all of these things is this idea that like, it's okay to be hungry, not that you Mm -hmm. are striving for hunger, but it's actually okay to let yourself get hungry before you eat, that there's not some prescribed schedule by which everybody everybody and everybody needs Mm -hmm. to eat like say every two hours or something. Mm -hmm. And I think that for me, that has been a big piece of trust too, is being like, Amy, it's okay to get hungry. It's okay to feel hunger. And then it's okay to um, eat until you're full and pay attention to those kinds of cues as well. Yeah, totally. And it's that tuning into your body, you know, it's feeling the hunger and saying to yourself like, oh, I feel this hunger that feels okay. And I'm going to sit with it. Mm-hmm. And then I'm going to have my next meal when, when it's time for me to have that next meal. Um, I think tuning in and sitting with that feeling is one of the most important things we can do when we're, when we're following these diets, like when you're on, if you're going to follow a keto diet or if you're going to follow a paleo diet, I think one of the most important things to do is tune in to how it's making you feel, <laughs> right? Yeah. Don't just follow the rules and follow the prescribed diet. And then, uh, you know, quote, fall off the wagon, and then you don't know what to do. It's when you're following these diets, if you're going to do that, tune into how it's feeling and kind of stay curious and experiment with how that food or how that grouping of foods that you're eating is making you feel. Yeah, I want to pull something out of there because I think it's so important, this idea of staying curious. So full disclosure, recently, my husband has been listening to um, Dave Asprey, who's the bulletproof executive Mm -hmm. and you know his namesake is bulletproof coffee and everything that goes with it and essentially what he teaches is a keto diet and he has this two-week jump start plan and my husband was like oh I'm kind of interested in trying it and I was like you know I'll give it a try and I think this is what is so important and what you were saying and maybe I can just bring it to life with this real world example so we set off on this two-week thing and my entire goal was not to lose weight was not to Um, become the perfect keto dieter was not to do any of those things. It was to say, what does this feel like? What does this totally foods feel like? What does it feel like if I eat more fat? Because that's not a primary macronutrient in my diet. Most of the time, I just don't prioritize it that way. What does it look like if I eat less carbs? What does it feel like if I add some white rice in, you know, all of these different things. And from that perspective, it becomes more of an educational adventure. Mm -hmm. And I I really do treat these things as adventures. I mean, I'm a total food nerd. So like, I get that Mm -hmm. that might not be for everyone, but they can provide information. So I actually don't think that these like prescriptive eating plans are all bad, Mm -hmm. but they're only good in so much as they give you information that you can then take and apply to your real life, which means I've learned that like starting my day with carbs doesn't make me feel my best, that I'm actually better if I can like hold off a little bit and backload my carbs at the end of the day. That doesn't mean I'm eating low carb. It just means that I'm 
eating in a way that works for me. And I actually prefer not to not have a name for it because it means it's uniquely mine, right? Yeah. Like my thing. I don't talk about it much because it's not your thing. And I don't necessarily mm -hmm. think it would work for anyone else. It's for like my unique body and activity level and lifestyle and what I can maintain over time, like what's mm -hmm. realistic. And it also ebbs and flows daily. And I don't want anyone looking at the donut I have with my kids on the weekend and thinking, Amy said she doesn't eat carbs in the morning. Like, you know, I, I'm eating what what works for my life now. And I think you kind of mentioned this in our pre-talk and I want to dive into this idea of the myth of perfect eating mm -hmm. because I think it applies to so much of this. So tell us a little bit about like, why is perfect eating a myth? Because I think we all have this idea that someone somewhere can tell us exactly what to eat. And if we did it perfectly, all our food woes would be solved. Totally. And I think, so I was thinking about this concept of perfect and perfect is like this fixed concept. It's a destination. It's an arrival point. But food and health and wellness and fitness is never a destination. I mean, there's never an, an arrival point. It's a daily practice. And so the two of those things, that, that uh, perfect mentality and being consistent with food and health and wellness and fitness, they can, they can never really go together <laughs> because yeah. perfect is a fixed notion. Um, so staying curious and keeping the flexibility in your routine when it comes to food and health and wellness and fitness is so much more beneficial than trying to get it just right. And I think that some of us might be thinking, oh, I want to do it perfectly. But I think a lot of us are thinking, I just want to get it right. Mm. You know, we think like, I want to get it right for my kids. I want to, I want to do it the right way. But I think that's a similar kind of trap because as you were saying, there is not one right way, you know, and you really do have to, I, I think of it as an experiment. You have to stay curious with what you're trying and what you're doing and think of it as an experiment so that you can find the right way for you at this point in your life. Mm. Because that's the other piece is it's going to change as your schedule changes, as your body changes, as your hormones change, like it's going to change. So you always have to kind of sit with your body and stay curious as to how you're feeling and how that particular way of eating is influencing that. Absolutely. I'm feeling that so hard right now. So mm -hmm. some folks who work with me will know that we are about to move at the end of June from Seattle back to the Bay Area. And so I haven't shared it on the podcast yet. So I'm moving soon, which brings with it like two little kids and a dog and a house to sell and potentially a house to buy. And like, it, there's a lot of things going on. Mm -hmm. And truly, like for the past few months, I have been able to make fitness a priority in my life. In terms of fitness is always a part of my life, but I've been spending more time at the gym because I had some goals to like build as much muscle as I possibly could. And that takes time. You know, it takes going to the gym. It takes a barbell. Mm -hmm. It takes all these things that aren't for everyone, but it was feeling really good to me. And just yesterday I was telling my husband, I was like, I think I need to sit down and reassess my goals because amidst recording podcasts, working with clients, cooking for our family, packing up a house, figuring out like where the kids are going to go to school next year, all of these things. I really mm -hmm. legitimately don't have time to go to the gym or maybe the gym is not my priority with the time that I do have. Like I have other things I need to focus on, which is always my preference to say it that way. Then like, I don't yeah. have time. Like, sure. I can make time, you know, you can make time for anything and I could keep my son from his nap and we could go to the gym, childcare, like all of these things, there's mm -hmm. endless possibilities, but I've decided it's not a priority. And so I was like, I need to figure out what I can do to stay active, to continue at least like hold on to the muscle that I have worked so hard to build. Um, and to feel good in a lot less time, like time that doesn't involve going to the gym, time that isn't an hour long workout. And I'm working on that in my head, but I think it's such a great example of this flexibility. To me, fitness, moving my body is a non-negotiable. It's going to happen, but it's going to look, look a lot different now than mm -hmm. it did two months ago. And six months from now, it's going to probably look different than both those things, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that that to me is like, I talk a lot about this idea of like, there is no wagon. And I think mm -hmm. that that kind of showcases it. Like there's no wagon. I'm not going to stop exercising because for me, it's a huge part of feeling good, of showing up as a great mom, of 
having energy to do all the things I need to do and to taking care of myself, right? This idea of self-care, but it does look different sometimes. And I think a lot of us kind of get caught up in the fact that it's not looking the way we want it to look. Mm. Like we're not doing it just right or we're not doing it perfectly. And we don't want to do it imperfectly. Like we don't want to, we're not willing to show up and only go for a walk twice a week when ideally we should be, we should, or we want to be at the gym five times a week. Like we're not willing to just do it imperfectly or when we're switching our diet or trying to figure out what works, we're not willing to be uncomfortable in that, not getting it just right phase or, um, you know, just the doing it imperfectly part feels not good. And so we're, we kind of don't want to do it, but you have to lean into those moments where it's like, it's just is what it is. And I'm going to, you know, come back to it every day. It, when I had said this concept of perfect being a fixed de destination and health and wellness is not a fixed destination. It's so much more beneficial to think of it as like a practice you return to day after day after day. And it's not going to be perfect day after day after day, you know, yeah. and just be willing to step into it each day with it, you know, as it is. Yes. So much yes to that. So how do you find what works for you? I heard you say that you have to get comfortable being imperfect to find the thing that works for you. And I so resonate with that. Like trying to be perfect all the time will never teach us what doesn't work. Right. And learning mm -hmm. what doesn't work is equally as valuable as learning what does work. Yeah. Um, so how do you find the things that work for you? I know we were talking specifically about food, but I think this applies to fitness and wellness in general as well. I, this is not a sexy answer, but coming back to staying curious and being gentle with yourself when you do feel like you misstepped or you're not working toward the goal you set or um, when you're not doing what you said you were going to do, just coming at that with a, uh, from a place of curiosity because that's where the learning moment is. So, so often we're kind of hit with that roadblock or what feels like a roadblock. And that's where a lot of us stop. But that is like where the information is <laughs> that we need to learn to keep moving forward or to keep going. So there was one time when I was uh, doing my own personal no sugar challenge for 10 days. I just, sugar and I, you know, I can, I have a sweet tooth and I can go after it. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's good for me to just occasionally hit the reset button and just remove it so that I can evaluate like my reliance on it and get back to a good baseline. So I was in this no sugar challenge and I was working at the library at the time and we were at a meeting and I was about seven days in feeling good, wasn't even thinking about sugar anymore. And I sat down and they had put like a big pile of little mini candy bars at everybody's spot. And I looked at them and I didn't even think about it. I was just like, oh, it was like a neutral thing. Mm -hmm. And then at some point in the meeting, I looked around and saw that everybody had empty candy wrappers at their spot. Everybody. And I just remember seeing the empty cat candy wrappers and thinking, oh, I better have one. And without thinking, I just had one. And in that moment, old me might have said like, oh, I failed. I can't believe it. I was seven days into this. And I totally messed it up and then kind of let my thoughts spiral out from there. But instead, I just thought, that is so interesting. <laughs> like the whole process of sitting down and not wanting it and seeing all the other rappers and really just kind of staying curious. It's like, oh, wow, I wonder why I did that. I didn't even want it. I wasn't even thinking. And to be able to think through that gave me so much good information so that in the future, when I'm just trying to minimize sugar or whatever it is, I can come into those situations having that knowledge of like, oh, well, when I see other people with the empty candy wrappers, I know that sometimes I'll just have it to not want to seem rude or to be a part of the group or whatever it is. I have that, that piece of information that I needed. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes so much sense. And it's funny because as you're saying that, I'm reflecting back on my story about the two-week keto challenge. Mm -hmm. And actually, I got the flu in the middle of it. And oh, my yeah. husband was traveling out of town. And we actually paused for a week in the middle. So our two-week challenge took us three weeks. Like, it was this mm -hmm. week and this week. And I think the fact that I hadn't really even thought about that is such a great example of what it looks like to be totally comfortable with imperfection. 
And mm-hmm. what's funny is we, it's not like we started two more weeks when we started again. I just was mm-hmm. like, well, this isn't working for us right now. Mm-hmm. And maybe it'll work for us again in a week and we'll reassess. And then we did it for another week. And then we were kind of like over it. And this like ability to sort of like bend the rules that someone arbitrarily created, right? I think is really key. And it's why so much of this podcast is focused on answering questions. And so often the answer to those questions is it really depends. And here's some information to see what works for you. Because like even my episode on like, do I really need an instant pot? The answer is like, well, it depends. What do you like to eat? Mm -hmm. How do you cook? How much space do you have in your kitchen? And that extends to this idea of living a healthy life and being a healthy mom and you know, fitness is going to look different depending on how busy your life is and what your setup looks like. And it's, it's so individualized. Um, yeah. You were also saying something about like noticing that that's something that you do. And I've been reflecting a lot on this word intentional and this idea of like, I don't care if I eat sugar. It's not a thing for me, but I want it to be a choice. And mm-hmm. it sounds like you were kind of saying the same thing is like, I want to know that I made a choice that wasn't dictated by either my, I hate using the word addiction with sugar because like, I think they're different, but um, not because I was driven and I couldn't stop myself is maybe a better way to say that, or Mm -hmm. because I was just doing it because everyone else was doing it. I want it to be Mm -hmm. like something I'm excited about enjoying and then it's just another piece of my life, right? So this idea of like intentionality, I think keeps coming up. And it's actually one of the things we talked about, which is uh, around trusting yourself and asking, what do I need right now? So can you talk to us a little bit about like that exercise of asking yourself, what do I need right now? And what does that have to do with this curiosity? So I was talking to some moms, some mom friends recently, and this is something I hear a lot amongst my friends and something that I hear with clients and people on social media. Um, And maybe you can relate. It's the nighttime, um, the nighttime release, the nighttime snacking. Once we put the kids to bed, so often we just feel like we need to hit that release button. We need to um, de-stress. And a lot of us use wine or food or whatever to do it, which is fine. Um, But the moment comes in, in sitting with yourself. So if you put the kids to bed and then you're coming downstairs and I was talking to a mom who said she felt like, she just like goes for it, you know, like all day she's restricting and holding back and then there's nobody around to have to share food with or to judge. And so she just goes for it. And it's in that moment, if you can just tap in, tune in and ask yourself like, man, what, what do I need right now? Like what's happening inside? What am I feeling? It doesn't mean that you don't eat or drink that thing. It just means that you're tuning in to what's like, what and if there are some underlying um, influencers that are causing you to eat more or to drink more um, and really trying to tap in and address those pieces of the puzzle. Um, So often we get focused on the food or the wine or whatever and try to restrict that or eliminate that. Um, But if we can focus on kind of the underlying reason why we're using it to feel better, and kind of trust ourselves again and stay curious and get in there and see like, what's really going on? Am I just exhausted? Am I hungry? Cause I didn't eat enough dinner. Um, you know, what is happening and address that problem. I think we'll get, we'll get to that place of feeling good faster. Yeah. You know, it's so funny cause I, I love a good glass of wine and I do mm-hmm. have one many nights, yeah. but one of the things I've realized recently is that sometimes I'm just really tired and I need to go to bed. And it's Mm -hmm. not like I'm like, oh, I'm going to drink less wine because, you know, I feel like I am choosing it intentionally. But I Mm -hmm. did realize that sometimes I'm using it because I'm really tired and it feels like something to like keep me up and I'll get work done and it'll be a treat. Mm -hmm. When in reality, what I need is to go to bed at eight o'clock with my kids. And again, it's not about avoiding the wine. It's just strictly Mm -hmm. like I'm not going to have the wine because I'm going to bed and going to bed is actually what I need. And so I think that goes along with it is like it is naturally resulting in drinking less, but it's not about drinking less. Obviously there are folks who that is a different equation for it. I'm not trying to make light of um, alcohol choice equations, but for me, that's been my experience. And I think the same is true with like eating ice cream at night, right? Like, do I really want ice cream right now? Or do I really need to go to bed? And all these things can actually wait. 
<laughs> right. Yeah, totally. And I think that when we just focus on the food and just try to control the food or, you know, control what we see as the problem, um, that doesn't work. <laughs> you know, we find that that, that that doesn't work. We don't have the willpower or whatever it is because that's not the issue. <laughs> right. The issue is that you're tired and, and you didn't get enough to eat at dinner and you're stressed and maybe you need an outlet for creativity or maybe there's something else that needs to be addressed that will actually, uh, quote, fix the problem so that you can feel good and not have to rely on that food or drink to feel better or numb out or whatever it is. Yes. It's so interesting because I recently did an episode with Danny Spees and we talked about healthy Mm -hmm. habits for kids. And she shared a question really similar to this. She said, she asks herself, what would most feel like love? Mm -hmm. And I think your question gets to the the heart of it also. What do I need right now? Um, This idea that it's not always food or drink or a treat or even a TV binge, right? Like it Mm -hmm. may be something else entirely and tapping into that, being more intentional, listening to ourselves, to the wisdom that's within us can go such a long way. And just while I'm thinking about it, I will link to Danny's episode in the show notes for this episode, cookingwithwholeplate.com slash healthy moms is where it's going to be. And you can listen in on my conversation with Danny too, if you're interested in like building your healthy habits along with your kids' healthy habits at the same time. And actually, that's a really good segue because one of the things that we wanted to talk about or the thing we set out to answer is what are some good habits and strategies for healthy moms? I think a lot of what you have have shared (laughs) has come down to this idea of like it really depends and listening to yourself and your own wisdom and giving yourself like space and time to do that goes such a Mm -hmm. long way to figuring out what you really need when it comes to food and fitness and all of these things. But what for you are some like non-negotiable healthy habits that you have in place? So I have something I call an anchor habit, which is something is just one habit. And if I have time, it's two habits, but it's something that I do most days that I don't have to think about. And that helps me feel good. And the, the one anchor habit is having a smoothie in the morning. Um, for a million reasons, but mostly because I don't have to think about it. Like I can just get up and make it. And I know that it helps me feel good. I know it gets me to lunch feeling full and energized. And I don't have, mostly I don't have to think about it too. I don't have to clean up a lot, right? Like just get up, make it, rinse it, and then I'm done. Um, And then my second anchor habit is just kind of getting outside and going for a daily walk. Um, And that one sometimes gets cut, (laughs) depending. But um, yeah, those are the two things that I do that are non- really non-negotiable. They're just things that happen. And again, like if I'm going to have a donut, like you were saying, if I'm going to have a donut on the weekend, totally cool. You know, it's not like it's a rule. It's just kind of a habit, a guideline that I follow that I know is going to help me feel good. It's kind of like when Steve Jobs would wear his uniform every day. Um, You know, like we've heard that story that it just kind of eliminated that getting out of bed, deciding what to wear. That's what this movie is for me. It just eliminates that that question, I know that it's going to just help me feel good. So that's kind of the, the one or two things that I do daily, but having an anchor habit, something that I can anchor to is important for me. Last week when I talked about summer food ideas, one of the things that kept coming up for me is like structure actually creates freedom. And Mm. this is an idea I've been playing with a lot in my life is like, where can I create structures where I make less decisions where my family has really clear expectations of like, here's when we eat and here's what's available and those kinds of things. Where can I create structures that then give me freedom to enjoy a donut without worrying how it's impacting my overall wellness because I have laid a healthy groundwork. Where can I create structure that makes me feel really good so that then I'm not cycling on these things that Mm -hmm. I should be doing. And I love that your habit is something you do right away in the morning Um, my, I I haven't heard this anchor habit term, but I really like it. Um, for me, I would say my anchor habit lately has been 15 minutes of meditation. I aim for 15 minutes twice a day. It often happens once a day and that's cool. Um, and if I can do it in the morning, I'm going to do it after our our interview today because this morning was totally hectic and I woke up late, but, um, if I can do it in the morning or at least before the kids get home from school, then that is something that sort of anchors me quite literally. Mm -hmm. And then I do everything else from a better place, you know, make good decisions, decide whether I'm going to work out, 
I, I love a good, like at least 10 minutes of daily movement, but I would agree with you around the walk thing. Like sometimes that doesn't happen. Sometimes it doesn't feel right. Sometimes it just quite literally cannot happen. And, um, that becomes okay. But how did you figure out what your anchor habit was going to be? Like, do you have a tool for helping people figure this out? Um, thinking back to what's worked for you in the past, like if you had to think back to, is there something that I've done, um, that really feels good? Like what helps me feel good? And then narrowing that down is just a matter of experimenting, you know, seeing one, what you can realistically do every day. Cause an anchor habit's meant to be done every day. So it has to be something that's easy or that you're willing to make time for on a, like a, you know, mostly <laughs> daily basis. Yeah. 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 So it has to be able to happen most days. It has to be easy. And, you know, tune in to see, is it making a difference? Like, does this really help me feel good? And those are kind of the two questions that I tell people to go on. Is it easy and you can do it? And does it like really set the stage kind of like your meditation? Do you have other examples of habits that folks have used after working with you that like we can maybe just give people some ideas for what these might look like for in other people's lives? Yeah. So meditation for sure is one. I tell people start with five minutes because that's something that's just like way doable. You know, start with your minimum baseline. If something feels like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. That sounds really challenging. Start with what, whatever your minimum baseline would be. So it's kind of, it's the, it's the basics, you know, it's meditation. It's some sort of daily movement um, and some sort of simple meal or snack idea and then kind of playing to see what works um somebody once it was actually eating a bigger breakfast like making the time to eat a big breakfast because she realized that like that's how she felt the best throughout her day she was a teacher and going to work and just got everything got crazy and hectic but having that big grounding breakfast helped her just perform best at work and so she created a schedule that allowed her the time to devote to that. Um, and that was her anchor habit. So just tuning in and figuring out what those things are, but typically they look like meditation, daily movement, or some, some type of food that helps you feel good. Cool. We're going to come back to this at the end. Cause you know, I love to tell, give people one action they can do as a result of our conversation. And I think this is going to be a really good one, but before we get there, we're almost at the end. One of the things we mentioned in our pre-chat was meal prep as a form of self-care. And I don't want to gloss over that because of course we are all about the food here, loving it, enjoying doing it, feeding our families well, feeding ourselves well, which I think often gets missed mm-hmm. in this whole yeah. parenting equation. So how is meal prep a form of self-care and what does that look like in your life? So um, meal prep as a form of self eating healthy is, or eating well, eating foods that fuel you is a great form of self-care, right? (laughs) Um, Because to me, self-care is ultimately something that is going to help us feel good and help us like um, uh, fill the bank, if you will, Mm -hmm. with uh, positive deposits rather than withdrawals. Um, So meal prep as a form of self-care is about taking the meal prep activity and making it a self-care moment. So just making it feel good. If it's something that you're going to commit to doing every week, um, then make it feel good. Put on an audio book or a podcast, Um, listen to music, Um, make sure you've got good shoes on so that you don't, you know, hurt your back, (laughs) that you feel good at the end of it. Um, Chat with a friend or um, bring a spouse, partner, or your kiddo in to chat with if that feels like something that's relaxing and Uh, a self-care moment. Um, But really kind of, if we don't have a lot of time, you know, if we are busy and we don't have the time for an hour a day of self-care or an hour a week of self-care, sometimes it's making the moments that we have a little bit um, more replenishing. So asking yourself, like, what can I do to make this feel good? If you dread self uh, meal prep. I know a lot of people kind of see it as this like, oh, I don't feel like it, not worth it or whatever. Um, And so if if you have that kind of resistance to it, then find a way to make it feel a little bit better and feel good at the end of it. I was listening to a podcast. It's called, uh, what's it called? The Life 
a link to it. Um, <laughs> it is a really interesting podcast, but she was talking about to-do lists and an alternative to that. And one of the things that she said is um, that everything that you write down, like you do a brain dump of everything you need to do. And her point was, there's actually nothing you need to do. Like, really, you don't even need to feed your kids. You choose to because you love them and you want to nurture them. And I just love this shift in perspective. Like, she was like, cross off anything you don't want to do. And it's true. Like, I think so often we tell ourselves a story like, well, I have to meal prep. The reality is you can make that look like whatever you want it to look like. And you can totally. totally choose not to do it. Like, you could hire a service. You can buy a meal kit. Like, there are a million options. You could make freezer dinners. Like there are more healthy options available everywhere. And I think this idea of being a little bit creative of treating it as a form of like, wow, I get to meal prep. How amazing is it that I get an hour to set my family up for success? I always think of it as like, I am not a big meal prepper in terms of like, I don't make all our meals at the beginning of the week, but I'll always slice up a bell pepper while I'm doing something else. Or, mm -hmm. you know, um, chuck, save some extra broccoli on the side. My kids love raw broccoli, which is something I don't understand because I only like cooked broccoli, but I'll save some raw broccoli on the side when I'm making something. And this becomes sort of like a meal prep back stock. And mm -hmm. all of that said, today, after we get off this call, I'm actually, I'm going to meditate, which I already committed to. But then I am following the one of the prep guides from Cook Once, Eat All Week, which is mm -hmm. by the woman who writes at Fed and Fit. And I, I'm going to do a review on the book and my experience, but she does like this bulk meal prep that involves like cooking meat one way and then prepping a bunch of veggies so that dinners come together really fast. Mm -hmm. And it's not my favorite style of meal prep, but for the way our lives are right now, it is a really good fit to like make sure we have healthy options on hand. And I remind myself, like, even if you don't want to eat the same thing over and over again, even if how you want to spend your time while your kids are at school is not meal prepping, I get to do this because I want the end result, which is lack of decision fatigue, mm -hmm. lack of spending all our money eating out, um, which is avoiding, you know, having to make decisions when it's about to be dinner time and the chaos that goes with that. And that shift to this idea of like, I get to do this and I am choosing to do it in this way is like a real helper, I think, around some of these healthy habits that sometimes don't feel like exactly what we want to do. Totally. It's all about flipping the script and how we're talking to ourselves and the story we're telling ourselves about the activity. Meal prep is something, if we choose to think of it this way, is something we get to do um, to save us time in the future, to eat better, to make it easier, to reduce decision fatigue, all of those things. But yeah, it's all about flipping the script. And the other thing is it's all about finding again, finding what works for you. You do not have to do the big meal prep where you're prepping for you know, seven meals in one session. Meal right. prep doesn't have to look that way. It can look however you need it to look for you in your life. <laughs> Again, I just feel like there's so much freedom in understanding and really taking in that, oh, I get to, I get to make it whatever it needs to be to fit what's going on in my life right now. Yes. Yes. I love that so much. And I think that that's like the perfect ending point because there is so much work around figuring out what works for you. But if you treat it as fun, if you treat it with curiosity, if mm -hmm. you treat it as something that is like a lifelong adventure, there's no yes. end to this, right? Like there's not an end state where this doesn't become important or something you have to do anymore. So mm -hmm. get rid of that feeling of, I just need to get there. And instead collect data, right? Collect data from your good decisions, collect data from your bad decisions, um, use all of it to inform just your next step. Like, what do I do next? And maybe yeah. I'll never use this book again, right? Maybe, maybe the second week that I'm doing is the only time I'm going to use it. And that's okay. Like, it doesn't have to be forever. And I know I sometimes do this where I like get caught up and like, it'll always be like this. Or if I do this, then I'll have to always be keto or low carb or like whatever it is. And the truth is, is that that just isn't the case. I've never found it to be true. I was gluten-free for three years and now eat gluten almost every day. Like, Things are malleable. And yes, there are some things that are solid, but every, the only sure thing is that everything's going to change, right? And that's true in yeah. life and it's true in food and it's true in wellness. Yeah. So, and keep showing up for yourself every day, you know, mm -hmm. and be willing to do it imperfectly, but you keep showing up and that's where you start to learn and keep moving forward. 
that's the yeah. consistency part. So if folks need some help in learning, it sounds like you're kind of an expert in this. Katie, where can they find you to learn more about the work that you do and what it might look like to like work with you and get some support on this adventure, shall we call it? Yeah. So my website is simplycleanmeals.com and I'm on Instagram at Katie Haynes 2 the number two. Awesome. So simplycleanmeals.com or Katie Haynes too. Mm -hmm. And both of those will be in the show notes at cookingwithfullplate.com slash healthy moms. So Katie, I am so honored to have had you on today. I really appreciate you reaching out and coming on the show and sharing so much of your wisdom. Um, I hope if nothing else that folks are inspired to figure out what works for them to know that like this wisdom lives in them and maybe they need some help in pulling that wisdom out, but the answers are already there. Um, and you uncover them through taking the next right step. So I, like I said, at the beginning of the show, I always, or in the middle, um, I always like to give people like one thing they can do. So I think based on our conversation, it would be amazing if folks would pick one realistic anchor habit that they can start incorporating into their lives. Remember Katie, I loved how you said like, maybe it's five minutes of meditation. By the way, it's taken me like eight months of meditating to get up to 15 minutes at a time. So (laughs) five minutes, a smoothie, a salad for lunch. I love pre-packed salads for lunch. I'll I'll include some links to those in the show notes also. Pick an anchor habit and then hop on over to Instagram and tag Katie and I. So it's Katie Haynes too. That's K-A-T-I-E-H-A-I-N-E-S-2, right? Mm -hmm. Or you can tag, and you can tag me at cooking with full plate is where you'll find me. We would love to see where your anchor habits are. Maybe we can share a photo of ours so folks can check those out as well. And I would love to hear in a few weeks after you start your anchor habit, what the impact has been, because I think that's just like such a cool idea to quiet the noise, focus in on one thing and make sure that's the one thing happening every day. So thank you for that inspiration. Yeah, I love it. Awesome. I hope you guys will check Katie out. I will be back again next Tuesday uh, with more wisdom on the Feel Good Family Food Podcast. Thanks so much, Amy.